unfolding he speaks to listening hearts unlimited by time and space every generation finds a father's open arms and a strong redeeming power of grace of grace to believe that I was as young as my granddaughter is now when I first met Jesus. He was a neighbor boy. We played together in the fields and our families went to the same synagogue. It's his story that I want to tell you, but it's my story too. I can't start at the beginning. I can't even tell you all that happened, but I can tell you that my life has been changed and it's not over yet. Jesus loved to play, to run, race, and fish, but soon we begin to see the signs that he was different from us. For instance, there was the time that we took our yearly trip to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. And he almost scared all of us half to death by getting lost. Except that he wasn't lost at all. When his parents found him, he was sitting in the temple court with the teachers. He said he had to be there. My parents wouldn't let me play with him much after that. Just didn't seem safe somehow. As the years went on, our lives took separate paths. I married, started a family, I kept up with the rumors about Jesus, and soon I found myself making a trip to Capernaum to see if the stories were true. I couldn't believe the crowd around the house where he was, fighting to get near him. They said that he had healed a paralyzed man who had been lowered down to Jesus through a hole his friends had made in the roof. But I didn't see it myself, so I followed him to the town of Nain. Oh, the look in that mother's eyes when he first saw her. He said to her, don't cry. Then he touched the funeral carrier and said, young man, I say to you, get up. He's alive. I can't believe my eyes. My son, who is this man? Oh, great God, my son, alive. Come 
come and see what God has done. How awesome are your deeds. Come and listen to our song. How awesome are your deeds. Shout with joy, shout with joy, shout with joy to God all the earth. Shout with joy, shout with joy, shout with joy to God all the earth. Sing to the glory of his name and offer him honor and praise. Shout with joy, shout with joy, shout with joy to God all the earth. Shout with joy, shout with joy, shout with joy to God all the earth. Come and see what God has done. How awesome are your deeds. Come and listen to our song. He has come to save his people. But this was a man who raised a boy from the dead. Who, besides God, has the power of life or death? Who, indeed? That was the question that was burning in my heart that day. Hi, I'm Richard. I grew up right down the street here. I guess I was an okay kid. We didn't do the church thing at my house. Of course, I was always expected to behave myself and all that. And I did, for the most part. I was always taught that the most important thing was being able to make a living, so I've worked very hard at that. I can remember how I struggled through college. I can remember the day after I graduated. I guess I thought I was going to feel, I don't know, maybe grown up, but I didn't. I was just the same guy. Now I was engaged to be married and scared to death. I just couldn't picture myself paying bills and cleaning the garage and having people over for a cookout. This was going to be a stretch. But I gave it a shot. Diane's parents helped us buy a condo, and I finally got a raise. After the baby was born, I thought for a while Diane and I were going to make it. But that just postponed our problems. We just couldn't seem to make it work. I sometimes can't believe that I am where I am. Okay job, broken marriage, one bedroom apartment, just me, Diet Coke, and the TV. Life seems just like it always has, and nothing like I thought it would. I thought it would make sense by now. There are questions deep inside my heart And though I look, I never find an answer I watch as my world falls apart With no way to put it back together There must be something I can count on A purpose must exist I don't know where I'll be searching 
But I know there's something more than this Now the things I thought would always last Have crumbled into dust and disappeared I face the failures of the past And see there a wall of doubt and fear I can't find an answer I don't know where to look a higher purpose must exist I know there's more than this Speculation continued all over the countryside Our leaders in the synagogue tried to pin Jesus down about who he was and what he was teaching But he had no time for pious people except to call them insulting names like blind guides and whitewashed tombs He spent most of his time with nobodies homeless types, cripples or people so openly sinful that no devout Jew would be seen close to them. But he wouldn't say what his followers wanted him to say. Some said he was Elijah, come back from the dead. Or one of the other prophets revisiting us. I, Moses, bring you the word of the Lord. The Lord your God will bring forth a prophet from your brothers. Listen to everything he tells you. Everyone who does not listen to him shall be destroyed. And the Lord said, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone.
baptizer's words kept us looking for the Messiah. But could it be that the Messiah was Jesus? I would hear word of him in Bethsaida, Cana, all sorts of little villages. And when I could, I would try to see him. I heard the stories of him touching blind eyes and making them see and feeding thousands of hungry people with just one basket of food. Amazing things. But how could this be? He was Mary and Joseph's son. I had to find an answer. I was willing to look. An explanation had to exist. I knew, I knew there was more to this. I took one of those career aptitude tests the other day. It said that I'm best suited to do the job I'm already doing. This is not good news. I was hoping it would prove that I needed a drastic change in direction. My stress load is really starting to weigh me down. I have this friend at work who seems to, you know, cope a lot better than I do. It's not that he doesn't see the problems with the system, it's just that they don't seem to make him crazy. So I asked him, what was the deal? He just said, God. Then he asked if I had read my Bible much. That weekend, it was my turn to have Brian. We did our usual kind of thing, mostly video games and a lot of pizza. He really likes that double meat, double cheese, double over with indigestion special they serve downtown. All weekend, Brian kept singing this little tune that he had learned. Um, the wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man, nah, nah. you know, where did you learn that? And when will you forget it, I asked. I know, probably not the right thing to say, I'm sure, but it was really starting to get on my nerves. Anyway, he had learned it at Vacation Bible School. Oh, terrific. The Bible again. Funny thing, though, later that night I took Brian back to Diane's house and went back home. I knew that I hadn't been the kind of dad that I should have been that weekend, and now it was going to be two weeks before I could make it up again. As I lay in bed staring at the ceiling, I began to wonder what in life is really worth believing in. My formulas for making it through life, hard work, marriage, you know, all that stuff, were no guarantee. I didn't even believe in myself anymore. I felt like that house in Brian's song, that house on the sand, a complete disaster. <laughs> Something I can count on. I had to find an answer. A purpose must exist. An explanation had to exist. I don't know where I'll be searching. I was willing to look. But I know there's something more than this. There came a day. Believe it or not, my friend gave me a Bible the very next day. He left it in the bed of my pickup at lunch. I opened it up that night, thinking I would find that bit about the house on the sand. I knew that the New Testament was the part about Jesus, so I started there. And I read it that night. And the next, and the next, I kind of got caught up in the life of Jesus. The way that he could see through people, like that woman at the well and the rich man that wanted into heaven. Could he have seen through me? Can he see through me?
came a day when I knew the truth, and that day changed me forever. I was in the synagogue with my father. He's an elder there. And they brought in a man that I had seen at the gates for years. How is it that you are blind, but now you can obviously see? This man I told you about, he, he put mud on my eyes, and he told me, go wash in the pool of Sloan. I only did exactly what he told me to do. Now I see. Hmm. This man cannot be from God. This thing you say he did, he did this on the Sabbath? That makes him a sinner. But how can a sinner do such a miracle? What have you got to say? After all, it was your eyes he opened. He's a prophet. I don't believe this man ever was blind. This kind of thing just doesn't happen. Is this your brother, the one that was born blind? How did he get his sight back? Yes, he is my brother, and yes, he was born blind. How he received his sight, I do not know. You have to ask him. The glory of this miracle should go to God. This man you say is a prophet, is a sinner. We know this. Uh, uh, I don't know if he's a sinner or not. Here's what I do know. Once I was blind, now I see. What exactly did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? <laughs> I've told you all this before. You, you haven't listened. Why are you so, so interested in all these, these details? Do you want to become one of his disciples too? Why, you are a disciple of this man, this Jesus. We are disciples of Moses. We know Moses that spoke to God. We don't even know where this Jesus comes from. Now, that is remarkable. Here's a man who opened my blind eyes and you can't figure out where he came from? God, God wouldn't listen to an unrighteous man. Have you ever heard of anyone born blind who received their sight? No. I tell you, if this man wasn't from God, he could do nothing. You are evil. How dare you lecture us? Leave the synagogue. Never come back in here again. I followed the beggar that day. I somehow wanted him to know that I believed in what he told us. I saw Jesus speaking to him. Then I saw the beggar fall at his feet. All I could do was stare. Then I looked into Jesus' eyes and I heard him say, I have come to make the blind man see. And those who think they can see, show them just how blind they are. At that instant, I knew he was speaking to me. You see, I was blind, more blind than the beggar ever was. And I needed to be healed. In my world, the moon would never glow. Flowers never bloom in all their glory. I thought my days would come and go And darkness would always hide my story Why would you come and show your mercy To a beggar in my place? I was lost and blind and lonely Now I'm looking in your face you are faithful true and faithful Jesus light of all the world you're true and faithful from the Father sent to save me I will put my faith in you. I will put my trust in you. Jesus, only Son of God, you're true and faithful.
God, you're true and faithful. I told my friend at work that I had been reading some in the Bible. I had a few questions. If this is actually what God is saying to me, then there are answers to all these questions that I have. And that is worth finding out. As far back as Samuel, every prophet has told us about these days. They too were preparing the way for the Messiah. All my life, I heard my father reading the words of the Holy Scripture to me in the temple. Now it had deeper meaning for me. It's as if the writers were painting a picture of this very time. That was hundreds of years ago. But I was seeing these prophecies fulfilled. But thou, Bethlehem, Ephratah, out of you come one for me who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from ancient times. I knew Jesus had been born in Bethlehem. These scriptures that I had buried in my heart begin to reveal themselves to me. And as I stood on the road into Jerusalem, watching Jesus ride into the city on a donkey, these words echoed in my mind. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem, see, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey. Oh, how the people loved him that day. They danced and sang, and the children waved branches before him. But soon the religious leaders used their power to silence him. They had him arrested for blaspheming. He is despised and rejected of men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. They accused him of lying and blasphemy. They shouted terrible things at him, laughing and jeering as he dragged his cross up the road. I remember covering my ears. I couldn't help but cry. Nothing they said was true. He will not cry out or raise his voice. He will not raise his voice in the streets. And then they beat him, kicking him, spitting on him like he was the worst kind of criminal. Toward the end, he couldn't see for the blood in his eyes, and he could hardly walk. And yet, he never defended himself. He never spoke the words that would have silenced him. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted. Yet he did not open his mouth, like a lamb that is led to slaughter, like a sheep before his shears.
is finished. sure what to pray. I know that my life has not been perfect and I realize now that that's a result of my sin. I know now that you are who you say you are. That Jesus was sent to die on the cross to pay for my sins. That he didn't just die on the cross but he was buried and three days later he rose again proving that he had power over death and hell. I'm asking you now to forgive me of my sins and to come into my heart and to save me. Amen. Why would the maker of all the world make a way for me? Move toward me, he who spoke into being every pebble, star, and sea, speaks now to my heart what the answer must be. It was his grace, it was his grace, the reason and the way. It was his grace. It was his grace. There is a way out of every night of your loneliness. There is a road that leads to hope and forgiveness for every someone to hear. Jesus gently whispers what the answer will be. It is His grace, it is His grace, the reason and the way. It is His grace, it is His grace, why would the Savior take my place? Thank you. 
And then it was over. He was dead. I found myself carried along by the crowd that afternoon. It was preparation day, the day before Sabbath, and the people were in a hurry to get back to their homes. But I was wandering through the streets, feeling absolutely alone. On the day after the Sabbath, I found a place where Jesus' followers had gathered. It was just a room where we could mourn together. My spirit was crushed. I knew that I too had come to believe in Jesus the Christ, and now he was gone. It was pretty quiet that morning when suddenly three women burst into the room. They had been to the tomb, saw an angel, no body, an empty grave. They spoke to us the awesome truth. Jesus was alive. We in the morning found us, first light of dawn behind us. Sun spirit on we went, one last time to see our sent Jesus to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, and to give sight to the blind. When Jesus served as a sacrifice for our sins, he solved the sin problem for good, not for ours only, but the whole world. He is the bread of life. The one who comes to him will never go hungry, and the one who believes in him will never be thirsty. Jesus Christ rescued us from this evil world we're in by offering himself as a sacrifice for our sins. He is the light of the world. Whoever follows him will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. There is only one God, and Jesus is how we get to him. He offered him, himself in exchange for everyone held captive by sin, and he set them all free. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Maybe like me, you thought you had all the answers until you saw the truth of who Jesus really is. Maybe that happened today. Or maybe it's something you've been thinking about for a long time. Or is your story like mine? Mistakes and wasted time. A lot of painful consequences to bad decisions. Now is the time to choose the path that is true. Now is the time to choose the one who is faithful.
Son of God, your true and faithful. True and turn those lights on this morning and uh, I'm not going to preach a message a whole message (laughs) just want to share something with you from the book of John chapter number 11 
shared this yesterday with, at the funeral uh, for Miss Loretta, the homegoing. And so John chapter number 11, and uh, if you'll look there with me, this is, the, this is the funeral of Lazarus. The funeral of Lazarus, and Jesus waited. He delayed to come to the funeral. He delayed to come. The, Mary and Martha said, send word to Jesus. If he could come, Lazarus would be okay. He could heal him. But Jesus wants to show something greater than the physical benefit of himself. He wants to show something greater than the fact that he can help our lives. He wanted to show them something greater than that. And so he delayed. Lazarus dies, and they lay him in a tomb. John chapter number 11, verse number 17 says, Then when Jesus came, he found that he had lain in the grave four days already. Now Bethany was nigh unto Jerusalem, about 15 furlongs. And many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha said, and Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary sat still in the house. Then said Martha to Jesus, Lord, if thou hast been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. Jesus said unto her, thy brother shall rise again. Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise in the resurrection at the last day. Don't you love it when people respond to uh, real spiritual things with religious answers? I know all the religious stuff. I know what we've been taught. This is what Jesus says to her, verse number 25. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection. It's not a religious thing. It's not an institution. It's a person. It's not a, a, a set of teachings or even a creed. It's a person. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth on me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believe it thou this? Jesus says, listen, let me tell you something, Martha. Listen, I can do more than heal people. I can do something greater than teach you the religious uh, institutions. He said, I am the resurrection. You see, you have to understand that Jesus proclaimed the singularity of the method of reaching God. Amen. It was not through religion. It is not through a varied sort of ways. Jesus said, I am the resurrection. Amen. If any man believeth this, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Praise the Lord for that. Jesus will say in John chapter number 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus is pronouncing the singularity of appeasing the wrath and the judgment of God, and that's only through one person, the resurrected Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, praise the Lord. He does not only deal with death. He does deal with life. It tells us in this verse. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. I'm so glad I don't have to wait to get to heaven to get to know Jesus. I'm so glad I don't have to wait for Jesus to get to heaven, for Jesus to impact my life. But in order for him to impact my life, I must believe that he is the resurrection. It is paramount that my faith is not in an institution or not in a, in a, in a, in a uh, creed or a methodology. My faith is in the person of Jesus Christ who died for me. But praise the Lord, rose again. It's unique that Jesus proclaims himself the resurrection even before he rises from the dead. You know what he's declaring? His own deity. He does not suppose this might happen or hope this might happen. He declares it has already happened before it even took place. I am the resurrection and the life. So he deals with the problem of death. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Oh, I'm so glad that my hope of life in heaven, life beyond death, is not based in any intellect of man, not based in any religious institution, but based on the person of the Lord Jesus. Amen. And he says, listen, I have victory over death. Oh, grave, where is thy victory? Oh, death, where is thy sting? I'd much rather face death in faith of somebody who already has had victory over it. Amen. But praise the Lord, he doesn't only uh, tell us about death, but also about everlasting life. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. You say, wait a second, Lazarus just died. Can I tell you, death just simply means separation. Physical death is separation from body and spirit. But eternal death is separation from God eternally. Yesterday, we had the funeral for Miss Loretta. And there her body was in the casket. But you know what I told them? Miss Loretta is very much alive. Amen. She is in the presence of her king. No more pain. Not because of her goodness. Not because of her religion. Not because of her value. But because of her faith Amen. in the resurrection. The person of the resurrection. But it's interesting, it says in this verse, And whosoever liveth and believeth in me. Can I help you with something? It's too late to believe in him after you die. Whosoever liveth and believeth in me. He says, that person shall never die. And then Jesus asked Martha this question. Believest thou this? Do you believe this, Martha? Do you believe that I am the resurrection? 
Jesus is going to show evidence of that in a few moments when he calls Lazarus forth from the grave. He said, Lazarus, come forth. And here comes Lazarus hopping out of the grave. He's all tied up with his grave clothes. Jesus says, go loose him. We were at the funeral yesterday, and I said, can I, can I tell you what happened the other day? Jesus got to the edge of heaven and said, Loretta, come forth. And she went from this life to the next life. Amen. Simply Amen. moving from, from life on earth to life in eternity. But she will live forevermore. Because while she lived, she believed in the resurrection. Now, let me just ask you two questions this morning. First of all, if you believe in something so powerful as the resurrection, it should do more than transform your death. It should transform your life. Oh, I believe in Jesus, and so I'm good after death. Oh, God bless you. He wants to do more than secure your death and eternity. He wants to affect your life. And when I put my faith and trust in Christ, he doesn't, just, he doesn't just say, I am the resurrection. He also says, I am the life. Can you imagine coming to that wedding altar? And the preacher pronouncing, I now pronounce you husband and wife. And you're like, oh, that's great. I was really hoping to have somebody to live with when I retire. Call me when we both turn 65 and we'll get together. Uh, no. No. Marriage is not for what will be. Marriage is for what is. And what will be. Your relationship with Christ is not just for what will be. It's also for your life now. Jesus says to Martha, believe us now this. But maybe you're here this morning, and if you were honest, your hope of eternity is not based in the resurrection. It's based in the intellect of man. It's based in the experience of man. Or it's based in a religious institution. Can I tell you, those things will not, will not survive past death. You cannot resurrect intellect. You cannot resurrect experience. You certainly cannot resurrect religious institutions. But there is one who has power over life and death. And that's Jesus Christ. And Jesus would ask you this morning, these are not my words, these are Jesus' words. Believest thou this? He is proclaiming the singularity of the way of God, to God. Only through the person of Jesus Christ. What this demands that if there is a requirement for belief when thou livest, in order to ever live again. If there's a requirement to, to believe so that thou shalt never die, or even if thou wast death, thou shalt live again, what happens if there is not belief? Or what happens if there is an alternate belief? Well, preacher, I just think God is going to say it's okay. I just think God's going to say it's okay. For God to say it's okay, He must bring shame to the person of Jesus Christ. He must bring shame. There is one way to God. I heard on the news the other day that it is, the, it is the fringe of the Christian movement to believe that Jesus is the only way to God. Well, welcome to the fringe. Amen. We believe Jesus is the only way to God. Amen. To be honest with you, if there was another way, then it would mock the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. It would mock it. It would shame it. And if we were to say there's another way, we mock the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So really you have two options. One, you believe in the resurrection. Your faith is in the person of Jesus Christ. Your hope of eternity and even your present life. And you put your faith in that. Or, Jesus was a crazy person. A lunatic. A fraud. He was fake. And he certainly wasn't God. Well, my faith is in the Word of God. Amen. And says He is the resurrection. Where's your faith? So I would ask you, like Jesus asked, believest thou this? Lord, I pray that you'd help us this morning. Even as we have a time of prayer and invitation, maybe this morning, Lord, maybe there's this morning some, some Christians, those that have put their faith in the resurrection, they know that if they died today, they'd spend eternity in heaven because their, their hope and their faith is in Jesus Christ. But be, they have become apathetic and they have become disinterested and they become self-centered when it comes to Jesus Christ also being their life. He is put on the back burner. Worship of Him is subjugated to occasional. Service of Him is just simply if I have time or feel up to it. And giving our life to Him, serving Him, doing our best to live a life that is righteous and holy with His help seems like something that's just beyond our willingness. Lord, may those believers 
see the resurrected Christ as the one who transforms their life and their belief in him demands worship of him and service to him. Lord, and maybe there are some today that if they're honest, if they died this very moment, their faith is not in the person of Jesus Christ. Their faith may be in a religious institution, a church, a baptism. Their faith might be in their experiences. Their faith might just simply be in their intellect. But Lord, maybe this morning, through the music and through what was presented, they have been confronted. And your spirit would even speak to them this morning and say, this is the truth. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Amen. Believest thou this? And maybe today, they put their faith and trust in Jesus. They would recognize that he died for them because they're a sinner. They'd put their hope in him and ask him to forgive their sins and trust in him as their Lord and Savior, as their God. Whether it's the first century or the 21st century, Jesus is still the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by him. Maybe this morning you need to make a decision for the Lord.